everyone, this is Matt Tu's show with Intro Stats, and today we're looking at a very important topic, bias. So what, what do we mean when we say a data set is biased? For biased versus unbiased data. We say in statistics that we want unbiased data, but oftentimes what we get is biased data. So what is bias and what are some different types of bias? So it's important to be aware of these uh, of bias and how that, how that can reflect your data and what you can and cannot say about populations. So this is a good topic to talk about. So let's start with a couple of basic definitions. We've already kind of gone over these definitions before, but I just want to remind you. When we say population, we mean uh, the collection of all people or objects uh, that we want to study. Right? So a population could be big or small. Uh, again, we said the larger the population, the harder it is to really get good data on that population. So if my population is everybody in California, that's going to be pretty tough to get data, good data on. So bias, when um, again, we, remember I, I kind of told you that we need to have, uh, in stats we have different definitions for terms, so then maybe what you're used to. When a statistician says bias, or the data was biased, they're referring to when data does not reflect the population. So for whatever reason, the data is messed up. It's not really reflecting the population that we want to study. Okay? So kind of keep that in mind. So when your data does not reflect the population. But there's lots of re ways that could happen. So let's start in with all these different weight types of bias. So our first type of bias is often referred to as sampling bias. Sampling bias. So this means that the method of collecting the data is flawed, okay? And usually it means you did not take a random sample. Uh, random samples tend to be more representative of populations than non-random samples. This is why random samples is such a big deal uh, when you collect data. One of the things I always look for when I, when I read a, a scientific report or something like that, I always look at how was the data collected? Did they use a random sample? Or was it non-random? Okay, so um, one of the things we talked about last time was some various ways that people collect data. Uh, convenience sample, for example, is where somebody takes data from people or objects that, have, that they have easy access to, right? It's very convenient for them to get that data. But we found that that really doesn't reflect populations very well. If, if you're looking to, to, to try to figure out data on all of California and all you ask is your friends and family, your friends and family are probably not going to represent all the people in California. It's just kind of obvious, right? So that would be referred to as sampling bias. The technique was bad. Also, voluntary response samples, where you put a survey out into the world and allow anybody to fill it out. We found out last time that, that those oftentimes uh, are not very reflective of populations as well. So both of those would be the prime examples of a sampling bias where the technique, right at the beginning I knew the technique was bad. Usually, again, uh, these are ones you want to watch out for. Usually, it's, um, if I see the technique was convenience or voluntary response, I'm less likely to try to make an opinion about populations from that data. Okay, so the data could be messed up just by the collecting method. But now that's not the only way. You could have a great random sample. You could have a census and the data is messed up. So that this, now we're getting into some other ways that people mess up data. All right, so one of our next, our next uh, type of bias is called question bias. This is, uh, we're getting into a little bit of ethics, really. I mean, a lot of this stuff really is, uh, is ethics. Uh, talking about what people do in statistics sometimes. Um, for example, uh, there's a famous kind of statement, I think I wrote it over here. Uh, there are lies, there are really bad lies, and then there is statistics. Okay? Uh, if, if you have a, you know, a large, most of the world, most people in the world do not understand statistics and actually have never studied the subject, so it's very easy for someone to manipulate them, for someone to uh, deal, use data and use techniques to uh, support some kind of agenda. Okay, so this really comes into ethics, like the, the, the data scientist, the person working with the data really has to have good ethics when they're doing this. And for the most part, 
the, the, the data science community and statistics community do have really good ethics. It, this, I tend to f see these more um, in, in, in just occasionally, but, but uh, you, you have to be watching out for it. So this question bias. Question bias is where the question is phrased in a tricky way with extra information to sort of sway the reader one way uh, to give a certain answer. So if you want to get, get, collect some data, but you need it to, you need the data to, um, uh, you want data to reflect that your business is really good and people think your business is really good, well then you could phrase the question in sort of a tricky way to force people to say that your, your business is good. Okay, so it's, it's, it's really uh, sneaky. This is also why when I look at a, a scientific report or some kind of report from a business, one of the things I always look for is not just how was the data collected, but how did they ask the questions in the survey. That would be very important. Always look at how they ask the questions. You should be very neutral about it. You shouldn't be trying to sway the person one way or the other. So here's a famous, famous example. Uh, this, there was a study done years ago, um, and the question that they asked was about veto power. Should the president, the U.S. president, have the power of veto to, um, you know, veto laws passed by Congress? So Congress passes laws, but then the president has the power to veto those laws. So should that be a, should the president have that power? And they were asking U.S. Um, people in the U.S. whether the president should have that power. Now what they should have said was, should the U.S. president have the power to veto laws? Okay, that's pretty straightforward, right? That's how they should have asked the question if they wanted to get some representative data. But this, this is how they asked the question. Should the U.S. president have the power to veto laws in order to eliminate waste and help the economy? You see that? It's very sneaky. Because most people reading that, when they got that question, didn't know the question was actually about veto. They thought, oh, well, yeah, U.S. president should uh, eliminate waste and help the economy. Oh, yeah, that sounds about right. That sounds about what, what a president should be doing. So they would say, yes. Yeah. So we got a large percentage of people said yes to this. So this, even though this was a, a, a simple random sample, one of the best sampling techniques we have, it was a large simple random sample, usually that's good. But this one was not reflective of the population at all because of the way they phrased the question. They forced a lot of people, almost everybody that read this said yes. Okay? And it wasn't really reflective of what they really wanted to measure. When they redid the study later, and they, and they just asked the question, they had an independent statistics company redo the study later, and just asked the question more neutrally, then they, I think at the time, they got about a 50-50 response. About, uh, so it was definitely a lot less people said yes to this um, when they asked the question this way. Okay? So always have an idea, okay, if, if somebody's... You should ask your questions very neutrally. Don't try to sway the reader by, uh, by uh, phrasing your question in, in a different way. Also, uh, giving extra information. I, I've seen a lot of times, this, you see this a lot in businesses where businesses will say, here's all the reasons why my business is the best on the market and blah, 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 blah. So do you think my business is really good? Right? You've already told them why your business is so good, and now you're saying, is my business good? And then, of course, a lot of people that you're reading that said, sure, yeah, it looks like your business is good. So then you, then you come up on, on, online and say, oh, my business is one of the best businesses out there because a high percentage of people think my, my business is really, really good. No, you just phrase the question in a tricky way to force people to answer that. So you could have a census or a simple random sample, but if you have question bias, your data is not going to reflect the population. All right, let's look at another one. Here's a couple, here's a number three. So another type of bias, response bias. So response bias is one of those ones that's difficult. Um, now we're getting into more of things that we need to sort of think about a little bit. This is where you're asking a question that people are likely to either lie about or not be able to give you an accurate response. Okay? So this is sort of, um, so for example, if I go around asking people how much they weigh, right? Asking people how much they weigh. 
You know, I'm going to get probably a lot of people that lie about that answer, right? Not many people are going to give you the actual uh, how much they weigh. Maybe a better idea is have them step on a scale, right, and, and measure it that way. Don't ask them how much they weigh. Um, you're very likely to get a large percentage of your people that might lie about that answer. Here's one, a controversial topic like, are you an alcoholic? You should... If I walked up to people and said, are you an alcoholic? First of all, they're going to get super mad at me, probably. But they're also likely to not tell me, right? Even if they did have problems with alcohol abuse, they're probably not going to admit that to me. Um, topics like alcoholism really need, the person needs to feel like they're in an anonymous format so that they can feel more comfortable admitting to that. So we have to always think about, it's not a good idea to walk up to people and ask them if they're alcoholics. Again, you're going to get a large percentage of people that are going to lie or get really mad at you, okay? But it can also, it doesn't have to be just lies. It could also be just the person doesn't know, really. Um, so they're, they're estimating, and it's not maybe a very accurate estimate. For example, if I walk up to someone and say, how much money do you spend when you eat out? Well, that's a really difficult question to answer accurately. I mean, I don't think I could even answer it very accurately. I say, okay, well, I went out the other day and I spent $18. And, and then when I went out again, I spent $12. And uh, after that, I spent, uh, let's see, oh, I went one, I, I think I spent $10. I'm going to say around $15 is how much I'm spending when I go out. If you notice, that's not a very accurate answer, is it? It's, it's not, you know, I, I, there, there's no accuracy on that. So these kind of questions have accuracy issues, right? That also falls under response bias. Response bias, either the people are likely to lie about the answer or people just don't know um, and have, have, have a difficult time giving an accurate response to that question. So that means that they, this would mess up your data, and your data would not be reflective of the population, even if it was a random sample, even if it was a census. Okay, let's look at another one. Non-response bias. Non-response bias. So this is when um, you select people or, to ask them questions, or they're, they're selected.